The title of this message is somewhat of a play on words. I'm speaking today on the subject, the perfection of the tongue's corruption. It is perfectly corrupt. He makes seven statements. Seven is the number of perfection in the Bible. Now, I need you to really give me your undivided attention so I can set this message up properly. In John chapter 6 and verse 60, they said of Jesus after he taught that the saying that he said was a hard saying. The bottom line, in this passage, uh, it's what an expositor deals with. This is not one of those verses that a preacher that is, is textual would ever deal with. He did not deal with a passage like this and say, you know, it's being too negative. Why say this? But I hope that you believe that every jot and every tittle in the Bible, since none of it will pass away, it is inspired by God, God breathed. He dealt with this in the church in Jerusalem and to the body of Christ that had been scattered. But I'm just telling you, it's kind of one of those that by the time we get to the end, you're going to say, I need to come up in order to get some fresh air, to breathe again. It, it's a hard saying. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16 that there's also some um, just hard things to understand. This one won't be so hard to understand as much as it will be a hard saying. And I'm watching you. Some of you are already reading thinking, good Lord, what's it say? <laughs> so uh, we will look at it together. The perfection of the tongue's corruption. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Beginning in the middle part of verse 5 where we left off last week. He's talking about the tongue and he says, see how great a forest a little kindles. Uh, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members, that so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the whole course of nature. And then as though he had not said enough, he says this, it is set on fire of hell. The next verse says that you can tame every fish, every animal, every snake, but you can't tame the tongue. He said it's an evil poison. It's verbal venom, the tongue. And I will give hope in the close of the message, but you will hear me in a moment for about 20 minutes and you're thinking, is there any hope? Well, if you preach expositionally and exegetically and you lift out the text, you let God speak for himself and then let him give clarity in our hearts. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, speak to our hearts. You could perform, as you have in the past, a miracle in some relationship, some marriage, some family that's become divided because of what someone said with their fire, their world of iniquity, their tongue that set on fire of hell. May we realize today that apart from your grace, we will never use the tongue for good as we ought. Speak mightily for Christ's sake, amen. You may be seated. After establishing the significance and the power of the tongue, James proceeds to address its greatest potential for destruction. The propensity and potential of the tongue is literally almost unbelievable. Note the descriptive language of James in an attempt to warn and instruct the body of Christ concerning the tongue. He says the tongue is a fire. He says the tongue is a world of unrighteousness or iniquity. He says it defiles the whole body. He says it set on fire the course of nature. It's an unruly evil and it's full of deadly venom. Seven characteristics of the perfection 
of the tongue's corruption. Whereas the tongue's power to control is neutral, being capable of working either good or for evil, this passage, the emphasis here, is entirely negative. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus made it clear that the tongue is a tattletale on the heart. Therefore, we might wish to heed the prayer of the psalmist. Do you ever pray this prayer? Psalms 19 verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And that's how you get the victory. When Christ becomes your strength, he is your redeemer, and you allow him to have control of your life. Then and only then can the words of your mouth and, yes, even the meditation of your heart be acceptable. And that's the word of a sacrifice that a priest offers to God. God will receive this as a willing and acceptable sacrifice. When the Bible speaks of the meditations of our heart, you know that word meditation is the word where we take it in. And then after a while, we bring it back up and muse over that statement, that truth. He's saying, I'm praying that what you're taking down into your heart, what's coming out, out, out of your heart, is that which your mouth is giving is pleasant. And if it's not, it is, is indeed evil. So it's what you put the bucket down in the well, and it brings up what's in the well. So I'm going to deal with two major statements and then try to define those statements and illustrate them and pray that the Spirit of God would make application and that I would make application as to how this speaks to us in the 21st century. I want to talk first of all about the tongue's devastating power. James uh, uses a word and he uses such a voice and tense in the word that it's a little different than when he normally teaches. He starts by simply saying, see. It's the word behold, but the difference is he uses a middle voice. And someone says, is that important? Middle is always in contrast to passive. It's not as though he's speaking something that he doesn't realize, understand fully, and agree even to the point that he's personalizing what he's going to share. I believe God has spoke to him passively. God has moved him along. He's been carried along by the Spirit of God. And he's been breathed into this word of verity and veracity. But he uses the middle voice by actually making it known that this is a call from within. This is one of those passages that if you muse over it, you not only see that God can take this and speak to somebody's life, but you realize how it's so true. You're, it's almost like you're reading it and you're saying, gosh, this is right. Amen. I understand. This is one of those passages that any preacher in the world can preach. And when he does, he didn't have to ask anybody to amen. He can amen it him own, his own self because he knows it to be so vitally true in his own heart and life. So James is saying this. It's like he's been teaching along and everything he said is important, but now he calls such a special emphasis and now he says, okay, pay attention. Sometimes when I feel like I want to make sure I make a special emphasis, I'll say, look this way. Everybody, look this way. It's like James is saying, man, we can't miss it in this area. And then he makes this statement. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Or see how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Here's a statement I placed in my message this week. This verse speaks of exponential potential. What it's saying is sometimes somebody says, you ought to invest here incredible return. In a negative way, he says the same thing. He says, your tongue is small, but it's going to have unbelievable return, exponential potential because of the tongue's propensity to say things that it shouldn't say. 
Let me share with you how the fire is so much different than the water that tries to relieve it. A fire has the amazing and virtually unique capacity to reproduce itself in an almost unlimited way as long as it has fuel to burn. Like the vast majority of things, say water for instance, water cannot multiply itself. When it's poured out, no matter where or on what, it never expands into a flood. But the fire feeds on itself. If there is sufficient and flammable material and enough oxygen to sustain the combustion, it will burn on indefinitely. You can't even think about fire without thinking about smoke. Smoke permeates, contaminates. It's amazing, just the damage. If you're never burned, or never scorched, just the smoke, the damage that it does. James is reminding us that a tiny spark can start a raging, uncontrollable fire, destroying millions of dollars of property. Only a spark is needed. Never underestimate the possible extent of the tongue's destructive power. He's telling us the tongue has the scope of inflammatory capability. James is saying that those who misuse the tongue are guilty of spiritual arson. A mere spark of an ill-spoken word can produce a firestorm that alienates everything it touches. Quite often, a little word angrily or carelessly spoken has caused war engulfing nations in bloodshed. Divisions of a once strong testimony for Jesus Christ, just the word pushed them away. The tongue is capable of performing the greatest variety of good, and yet at the same time, the greatest variety of evil. What incredible power the tongue has. James says, with a bit, one can control an entire horse's body. With a rudder, one can control a large ship. And with a spark, one can ignite a huge forest and destroy it by fire. It has devastating power. But then he goes a step further and he says, the tongue also has defiling pollution. If you lo love to read the Proverbs as I do, it is absolutely full of what words will do, uh, what the tongue has the capacity to do. I could bore you if I started just saying, let me do a, a running check of all the verses. I'll not do that, but listen to a couple. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Proverbs 16, 27, an ungodly man digs up evil and is on his lips like a burning fire. Proverbs 26, 21, as charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so a contentious man to kindle strife. Uh, verse 6 connects with verse 5 in that he says the tongue is a fire. It scorches, it burns, it consumes that which it touches. Now, as though that were not enough, and I'd like to go ahead and move on to something else and talk about something possible, uh, possibly positive, James describes four strong statements. Now, I just got to be honest with you. I'm a Bible teacher. Been doing this 34 years. When he just says something over and over and over again, when he's so descriptive, when he uses words that are so graphic, again, it's like he's saying, pay close attention. Don't underestimate the capacity of the tongue. I'm telling you, I, I don't know how to explain this. I don't like to be melodramatic. I have been in a, a contest of spiritual warfare all morning, not, not with anyone, other than I believe the one that would resist this type of message going forth with power and with clarity. And maybe I, I, I'm getting somewhat being a pastor like James, getting a heart something like James to be able to say, man, what serious damage the tongue can produce. 
Uh, I've actually envisioned this week that I'm preaching, and God showed me this Wednesday, that this sermon will be preached with such intentionality when I begin to illustrate it in a moment, that it has the power to put homes back together. Wow. And so I'll just be honest. Like the prophet Habakkuk of old, I carry the burden of this sermon this morning. If nothing else, I'm getting people's attention to say, good night. He's really buying into what he's sharing with us today. Four strong statements about what he's to remind them of. So let me just give you those four statements and try to illustrate them and, and bring some clarity from life. First of all, he says, your tongue is a world of iniquity. And, and I'm going to help you. If you're struggling with this sermon already and I'm just getting started, I'm just preaching to me and y'all are just getting to listen, all right? So just listen to how I work myself over dealing with the text as I try to incarnationalize what I read. My tongue is a world of iniquity. The Bible says that if you have love for this world in your heart, that it's difficult to love God, impossible. When he uses the word world like that, he's speaking of a world system, uh, the, the cultural belief of this world system. The word iniquity speaks of unrighteousness. He's speaking of a system of unrighteousness, a system of unbelief. It refers to evil, rebellion, lawlessness, and every other form of sin. He's saying this world system breeds and gives vent to every sort of sinful passion and desire. And you know that's true and so do I. He's saying no other bodily part has such far-reaching potential for disaster and destruction as the tongue. You can say something with your tongue. You can even take your finger, take what came from your heart, what you'd like to say with your tongue, type those words out, hit a button, and send it to anywhere in this world. Man, it is amazing the vastness of destruction that the tongue can bring in such a brief amount of time. The word world also speaks of widespread. As the world is characterized by evil, so is the tongue. So the tongue contains and conveys all the world system's wickedness. So he says, your tongue is a fire. You can start a raging fire. You can eliminate 17,000 buildings all with one lantern, one tongue. But then he goes a step further and he says, the tongue is so set. Now listen to that language. He's taking it in the part that you can see. My ears are bigger than it is. And I would appreciate if you'd keep your thoughts to yourself. But really when you, you look here at the frame of five, eight, and three quarters uh, with so much weight and to think about an organ that is so small and he's getting ready to say, Johnny, if you don't allow the Lord Jesus to control your tongue, it will control your whole life. You will be known. You will be discussed behind your back by others, by your tongue. So he says, he so set it among the members that it defiles the whole body. It pollutes the whole being. It stains the whole body. It contaminates the entire person. Your tongue, listen to that, defines you. Smoke and fire penetrate permanently contaminates everything it's exposed to. Words spoken carelessly, unwisely, and destructively can set ablaze the whole of our existence, affecting seriously our family, our church life, and our community life. Now, here's where I need you to listen carefully. If, if it's possible, I want you to move closer. Just pull your chair up some. That's good. Just right. That's good. Ladies and gentlemen, I know families that have been divided and whose members have not spoken to one another in years, all as a result of a few kind words. In my research and study this week, I found a story that really illustrated this well. Listen, listen to where the story came from. 
mountain climbers have said there are certain times and places when the vibration from a faint whisper can bring down an avalanche. Whenever the guide detects such sensitivity in the air, he can tell. He cautions every climber to remain silent. An avalanche of sorrows and separations may be caused from the faintest whisper of gossip, slander, lying, jealousy, bitterness, and the like. You know as well as I do, you've gone into these type settings before, you didn't know it, and the person with you said, be careful what you say. This individual is extremely sensitive. Where do you think we got that terminology? They wear their feelings on their shoulder. Watch what you say around them. Your tongue has defined your life. You are approached by others because of the way you use your tongue. He's giving us this variety of evil. Your, your, your tongue's a fire. Your tongue's a world of iniquity. And then we are so consumed by our rights that I have my rights. When you come to Jesus Christ, you surrender your rights. You live his life. If you, if you wanted to talk about rights, Christ would have never died for a bunch of sinners like us. He surrendered all of his rights. He left glory. He declothed himself of so much in order to clothe himself in humanity to become like us so we would have potential of becoming like him. Just a whisper. Someone says this. It's broken the relationship. And here's what the person says. Listen to the mountain climbers. I didn't say that much. It doesn't take much. Just a whisper. He said the tongue has the capacity to ruin everything within the context of your genesis. Wow. It speaks of the will of our genesis, referring to our life existence. Uh, it describes the course of human life. The tongue affects not only what we say, but who we are. What graphic language. The tongue not only contaminates ourselves, but also influences everything throughout the course of our whole life. Let me wrap it up with one last graphic statement. As though he hasn't said enough. He said, your tongue is set on fire by hell. Now that is powerful. Now, I'm just going to define this. I'm going to just tell you from everything I can do in research what I've found. Here's what it is. Johnny, remember that your tongue has its origin in hell. The source of this fire is hell itself. The uncontrolled tongue has a direct pipeline to hell. You know, every now and then, I want to say something, and I know it's not right. And hell is there promoting it. A pipeline to hell saying, say it, say it. Every now and then you hear a statement that sounds cute. It says, you might as well say it, you'll be charged for it. And by the way, that is cute, but that's not true. Okay, that is cute, but it's not true. No, thank God for those that by the power of the Holy Ghost of God have a thought, but refrain that thought with the power of Jesus Christ. The uncontrolled tongue. It's fueled by hell. It burns our lives. Wait a minute. It carries the connotation of being a filthy fire. John Calvin wrote, It is an instrument for catching, encouraging, increasing the fires of hell. James traced the source of the tongue's fire to a place of defilement, filth, and burning. The uncontrolled tongue is a hellish thing. The word that he uses for hell is our Greek word, Gehenna. What you did with your trash if you lived in Jerusalem, you went to a gorge called Gehenna. You threw your trash there. They also put damn animals there. Criminals that were crucified, tortured to death, were thrown there. Jesus could have been a candidate for Gehenna, but someone gave him, his disciples, a borrowed tomb. Think with me for a moment. Bodies are burning there. Dead animals are burning there. The trash is burning. When are they bringing it? Tens of thousands of people lived in Jerusalem in the first century. They're bringing their trash. It burns. It's never not burning. By the way, this is interesting. The only time in your Bible 
where you'll find the word hell outside of the gospel accounts is this one occasion in James. It's not even mentioned again outside of the gospel accounts. Three out of every, three to every one time heaven is mentioned, hell is mentioned, it's mentioned by Jesus. Sometimes people say, I don't think a preacher ought to preach on hell. If you never preach on hell, you don't preach like Jesus preached. So you may be a preacher, but you're not a Jesus preacher. Jesus would go to Gehenna, and here's what he would say. There's a place if you never repent. You will go to like Gehenna, where the worm never dies, and where the flames are never doused. And so he says, Phil, and I've told you this is a hard sermon. He said, your tongue, Johnny Hunt, is like a place of fire and filth. You're like the valley of Hinnom, the place called Gehenna. Your mouth has trash and garbage. It stinks like a dead body and a dead animal being burned. And it continually burns. And then to throw it all into chaos, he says in verse number 8, and no man can tame the tongue. Well, what help is there then? Well, verse number 2, he said, it's a perfect man that can control the tongue. And I only know of one, the Lord Jesus. And Jesus can take a tongue that is full of venom, full of evil, a world of iniquity, has caused the whole cycle of life to define you, and Jesus can touch that tongue. Here's what he's saying. I need you to know that it's not just a social problem that you have. This is a moral and a spiritual problem. There is a dire need for God's grace. Christ being the only one that controlled the tongue, he is the only perfect one. I close with this poem that I found this week. A careless word, just a careless word, may kindle strife. What did you mean by that? Oh, I I didn't mean anything. I'm sorry. Yes, you did. And it ends a relationship. A cruel word may wreck a life, may wreck a life, a marriage, a relationship. A bitter word may hate and steal. Boy, to hear a Christian say, I can't stand that person is just about more than I can handle. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless.